Welcome to a special edition of Sound Off Extra here exclusively on YouTube. I am the Solo Monster, and it is New Year's Day, January 1st, 2014. So before I go any further, let me wish everybody listening to this a very happy new year. Hopefully you survived the night if you went out, and hopefully 2014 brings you better things than 2013. 2013 was a good year for the Sound Off. Hopefully this year will be a lot better. So with a rare day off, I decided to go ahead and do an early Raw review as opposed to waiting until this weekend. So we're going to be talking about Monday Night Raw, a New Year's episode from this past Monday night in Richmond, Virginia. As I said in last week's Raw review, which I also did, coincidentally, on YouTube, WWE would be running a split crew, as they did on Monday. Half the roster was in Toronto for a house show. This is a, a big business period for them, this, this post-Christmas holiday period uh, in terms of live events. Again, I was at the Madison Square Garden show less than a week ago. They had a packed house there. So I presume the reason they did this is because it's big business and they can make twice the money. So you had guys like John Cena, Randy Orton, Big Show, Kane, the Rhodes Brothers, the Real Americans, AJ. All these people were not on Raw Monday night. Uh, they were kind of half-cocked, so to speak. So what do you need to know about this show? Instead of going through everything, let's just go through the key stuff here. And the biggest uh, angle, I guess, the biggest news coming out of Raw Monday night was Daniel Bryan. Joining the Wyatt family, Daniel Bryan was in a gauntlet match against the Wyatt clan. He beat Luke Harper first in a, a really stiff fight in that in that first part of the main event. Bryan took some hellacious bumps during that match. Uh, you know, what, what do uh, wrestlers call it? They, they call it, uh, every guy has a bump card, I think they say. That's the expression. Well, Bryan punched about 15 holes in his bump card last Monday. He took a beating in this match. Really good match, though. Uh, then he beat Eric Rowan before teasing a match with Bray Wyatt. Brian got jumped before it ever got started, so he wins by DQ. Punk beat the Shield all by himself a few weeks ago, and here Brian beats the Wyatt family, although under different circumstances. And Daniel Bryan, one of the biggest baby faces in the company, finally caved and joined the Wyatt family. Now, I see a lot of people bent out of shape about them turning Daniel Bryan heel. The only thing is, I didn't see heel turn on Monday night. So, I don't know what people were looking at, but what I saw was not a heel turn. You know, he didn't get on the microphone and tell the fans to piss off. Uh, he didn't really turn his back on the fans in that way. He admitted that no matter how loudly people cheered for him, and no matter how many matches he won, he could not overcome the machine. He couldn't beat the authority. And if anything, he was out there looking like a sad sack more than anything else. Uh, it made him look like a, just like a giant sap, but I don't consider that a heel turn. You know, maybe he'll come out on Raw this Monday, Raw old school, and and he'll heel on the fans. Maybe he'll maybe he'll dress up like a member of the Wyatt family. Maybe he'll come out wearing some overalls. He certainly looks the part, but we saw none of that here on this show. Plus, I'm sure it's all part of a ruse. You know, he'll stick with the Wyatts for a few weeks, and then he'll break away from them, probably at the Royal Rumble. You know, maybe he'll eliminate Harper and Rowan and get Bray all by himself. Or, or hell, you know, maybe they can drag it out and instead of Wyatt versus Cena, which is one of the rumored matches for WrestleMania this year, maybe they do the first Bryan versus Bray match at WrestleMania instead. I mean, I personally, I would rather they pay off the story they started with Bryan getting screwed over by, by Triple H and Stephanie and give the people what they want. But not looking too good right now. WWE doesn't always give the people what they want. Brian versus Bray, in place of, of that, wouldn't be the worst idea in the world. Now, I, I like the ending of this show. I liked it because it was something different. Not, not just them doing something different because we weren't expecting it, but it sucks. It, it was something different that I am intrigued by, and I am intrigued to see where they take it next week, and the week after that, and the week after that, provided they don't drag it out for too long. You know, and I, I dig Bray Wyatt in this cult leader role. I think he's really, really good at it. Uh, I was not a fan of the storyline they did three years ago where John Cena had to reluctantly join the Nexus. I thought it was dumb. I thought it was stupid. This, I don't mind because I'm convinced it's all part of a plan that Brian has to screw them over. Or, or maybe I'm just giving WWE too much credit and Brian, you know, maybe Brian really has surrendered to the dark side and he'll need John Cena or Brie Bella, or someone else to talk some sense into him. But I, I'm intrigued to see where they go with this. The fans love Brian enough where they won't turn on him so fast. 
And and when he does turn back, if it is all part of a plan, and in three or four weeks, maybe at the pay per view, again he gets Bray Wyatt in the ring. And I wouldn't want to do too much between them if you're going to build to a singles match. Don't give it all away. But if that's what they end up doing, the people are going to go nuts for him when he turns back. At least I hope they do. It, w- it would take a lot, I think, for WWE to really screw this up because the people like they like Daniel Bryan, and for them to suddenly not care or to stop liking him. Uh, it would take a real effort on their part, I think, to just completely break this guy down. And I and I know it looks that way. Certainly, I would not have booked him the way that they have booked him. I mean, every fan has their own opinion, but uh, I am I am cautiously optimistic here that there will be a a satisfying payoff and that Brian is not completely under their spell. Okay, so that's why I don't refer to this as a heel turn because I didn't see a heel turn on Monday night. The Beast is back. Brock Lesnar made his return to Raw with Paul Heyman, although it was kind of dumb how they did this. They they had Triple H, of all people, come out to the ring. The man who had his arm broken not once but twice by Lesnar. And he just comes out and says, hey guys, Brock Lesnar's back. And then the two shook hands and Triple H went on his merry way. And I know, you know, best for business and all that BS, but still. I mean, why, why couldn't you have Stephanie? be the one to come out there and make that announcement let triple h announce the title match for the rumble which is what stephanie did you know kind of reverse the roles maybe triple h finds out what's you know they do a segment backstage afterwards where triple h goes over to stephanie all upset like how come you didn't tell me about this why brock after all he did to us and she says oh calm down you know it's best for business but nope they had triple h out there as, as the person to do it so uh, kind of weird i did like how brock would not shake triple h's hand at first and he looks over at Paul instead, and Heyman just goes, you may as well shake his hand. He's the guy who signs the checks. They can never break these two men up again, ever. They need to stay together forever, Paul Heyman and Brock Lesnar. Heyman declared that now that we have one undisputed champion, Brock Lesnar is naming himself the number one contender for the title. And you know why he can do that? Because he's Brock fucking Lesnar, that's why. And if that isn't enough of a reason for you, those high-pitched primal screams he let out is probably another good reason. Uh, you know, either either they would strike fear into your soul or they would make you laugh hysterically. I know some people saw that and they just could not control their laughter when he had those high-pitched shrieks. But uh, actually, they, they kind of reminded me of this. And then we're going to Washington, D.C. to take back the White House! Yeah! I still love how excited Howard Dean was there, being that he came in third place in the Iowa caucus. Anyway, I heartily endorse this idea of Brock Lesnar as the number one contender to the WWE title. I I just talked about this a few weeks ago on the sound off, you know, pitching an idea as, as wild as it may be. I don't see them doing it, but, you know, getting the belt on Brock and pushing him, even if it's just for a couple of months leading into Mania as this monster heel champion. I think there's money in Brock Lesnar as a monster heel champion going into a a big show like WrestleMania. And you could do a whole bunch of different matches. I mean, really, you can plug Brock in with almost anybody on that roster. Even another match with John Cena. You could plug him in there with Punk in a rematch, which was one of the ideas I proposed. Daniel Bryan. You know, Brock and Bryan with, with Bryan as the underdog going into that match. I know it may seem like a mismatch, but I, I really think that and it doesn't have to be WrestleMania. I'm just throwing this out there for the future. Because Brock's under contract for uh, another year plus. He's, he's signed with them through WrestleMania next year in uh, 2015. So there's plenty of time if they wanted to do a program, maybe even at SummerSlam or something, where you match up Brock and Brian. I just think with their styles, they could go out there and have a great match. And Brian plays the underdog very well. You know, I hesitate to call him the, the Spike Dudley of WWE. I think that'd be an insult. But... You know, he, he really is is very good in that role. He's got the crowd support. You got Brock as this big, nasty bully. I just think it can make for a really fun match. But you could plug him in there with Batista. And they've, they've kind of teased it in a way because there was a video up on WWE.com where Paul Heyman was asked about Batista coming back. And Paul was like, who? And, and said something else. I, I don't remember what he said. But I don't know if that's a tease that they are going to do something with Brock and Batista at WrestleMania. I know the plan for a while had been reported as Brock and The Undertaker because Brock Rock fell through. Rock went on Twitter this weekend and admitted that the plan was going to be him against Brock Lesnar. 
but then he got hurt. He had to have surgery. Now he's got all these movies. So Rock is not going to be at WrestleMania in a match this year. And the plan then shifted to Brock Lesnar and The Undertaker. I still say, you know, you could put Undertaker in there with John Cena. I still think that's the big money match, ultimately. Undertaker and The Shield in some sort of, like, gauntlet-style match. I'm not a fan of doing that typically with The Undertaker. I think what few matches he has left should probably be big singles matches. But, you know, I keep going back to that idea. I kind of like that idea. And it could play into the breakup of The Shield. It's storyline continuity because the last time we saw Undertaker, he was laid out by The Shield. And, you you know, you start with Rollins, you go to Ambrose, you build to Reigns, and then however you want to do it, Undertaker can get the win. Streak stays alive. A lot of tension in the uh, in the Shield camp. You do the breakup on Raw the night after Mania. So taking Brock away from Undertaker, not the worst thing in the world because there's a ton of other people you could put him in there with. And uh, anyway, so Brock as champion's not happening. I know that. I know it's not happening, especially now there's only one title. If there was any chance at all of them putting a belt on Brock Lesnar, even though he's a part-time guy, that went right out the window when they unified those two titles because they would want him for at least some house shows. Brock Lesnar ain't working house shows. And now that you only got one title, if you put the belt on him, you have no championship match on any of your live events. So it's it's just not going to happen. Uh, but nonetheless, if they're going to build up a story and maybe Brock ends up getting screwed by whoever his mania opponent is and that leads to their match, that's fine. But what do you do with Brock in the meantime? Because it looks like he's back. He may have a match at the Royal Rumble. Do you put him in the Rumble match? Do you give him a singles match? What they did here was they had Mark Henry come out. Mark Henry had a, a brief skirmish with Brock before he got speared through the uh, the barricades. And then Brock gave him an F5 on the floor, which looked awfully painful because you got a guy as big as, as Mark Henry getting slammed down on his knees like that on the floor. And there's not a whole lot of give to those mats. So hopefully he didn't get hurt. But it looked very impressive. All these years later, you know, Brock had, had F5 Mark Henry way back when in his more youthful days. There's a photo online of it. So here we are all these years later, and he's still able to do it. That's pretty impressive stuff. You can build to a Brock Mark Henry match at the Royal Rumble on the undercard. I don't know what the purpose would be, being that we already got the big moment. The big moment was Brock getting him up on his shoulders and giving him an F5. Well, we've already seen that. And it's not like they're going to put Mark Henry over on Brock Lesnar. So that match probably makes less sense. What about a guy like Big Show? You know, when Brock first came back, I think I remember saying it on my show that if they wanted at some point to go do another Brock Big Show feud or a Brock Big Show match, I actually would kind of like to see it. And I am not the biggest fan of Big Show's in-ring work. I thought it was a huge mistake to put him in the Survivor Series main event. I think the buy rate probably bared that out. But... When those two guys worked back in the day, and I know it was 10 years ago or 12 years ago, but when they worked in the early 2000s and they went back and forth, they had a ton of matches Brock and Big Show did for the title, and they beat the ever-loving crap out of each other. Big Show got all beat up. Heyman was taking F5s every night. He had neck problems. Brock was, was all banged up and beat up. Those guys really kicked the hell out of each other. But I thought that some of Big Show's best matches from that period were with Brock Lesnar. In fact, my favorite a uh, Big Show Lesnar match was a stretcher match, which is a really stupid gimmick. The way WWE does, you have a you have a match where you got to put somebody on a stretcher and roll it across a line on the floor. It's it's one of the dumbest concepts, but those guys made it work. I think it was like Judgment Day back in uh, you know oh oh three maybe or something, and it was a great match. And I know these guys are a lot older, but there, there's a part of me that wouldn't mind seeing them do that. Big Show's not doing anything right now anyway. You know, last time we saw Big Show, he was dressed in a diaper, hyping up the New Year's Raw, where thankfully he didn't even appear. So if they wanted to do Brock Big Show on, on the undercard at Royal Rumble, I think that'd be a hell of an undercard match for that show. And probably would rather see Brock doing something like that than being in the Rumble. Unless they have some plan to set up his WrestleMania match by having him dump somebody out, if they're going to do something with him and Batista in the Rumble, I guess maybe that would be okay. But uh, I, I would not mind seeing Brock in, in a match with somebody like Big Show on the undercard at, at, the, at the Royal Rumble. Because I just think the Mark Henry match probably wouldn't make as much sense. Stephanie on this show also announced that the title match at the Royal Rumble is going to be Randy Orton defending his WWE Championship against, wait for it, John Cena in... A straight wrestling match. That's what she said. 
No stipulations, just John Cena and Randy Orton one-on-one in a wrestling match. What a concept. Now, Cena has his rematch clause in the storyline, so that's no surprise that he would get this match. And having just watched them wrestle at Madison Square Garden at a house show in a straight match, I'm sure that the match they have at the Rumble is probably going to be a lot better than their TLC match. And their TLC match wasn't bad, but you're always hampered by that, you know? And these guys are not made for a TLC match. That's why... The ladders weren't that tall. The titles were kind of hanging low. There were no really wacky bumps in that match. Cena kind of took one at the end and and botched it. But uh, just put these two guys in the ring one-on-one, and I saw them do it for 15, 20 minutes at the Garden a week ago, and it was a great match. People were buying into the near falls, and they were kicking out of finishers. It was was great. And so I don't mind the fact that they're going to go ahead and have a, a straight match without any sort of wacky stipulations here. It is a bit backwards to start with a TLC match in this feud and then build to a straight match, but, you know, it is what it is. The best part about this, to me, is that it means that we are not going to get John Cena versus Randy Orton at WrestleMania, which at one point it looked like maybe they were going to build to that rematch, you know, after Orton first won the title. Two biggest faces in the company in the main event. I I don't know anybody in their right mind who wanted to see that as a WrestleMania main event, so this pretty much confirms they're not going in that direction. This, this probably will be it for their feud if I had to take a guess. So I don't mind it. That's a good thing. Uh, I don't see Cena winning the title, so it will likely be another screwy finish because I, I can't see Cena being pinned cleanly by Orton. If they are building to something with Cena and Bray Wyatt at WrestleMania, that might be a good time to get that whole deal started. You know, maybe on Raw in the next few weeks or, or even at the pay-per-view, we get a brief backstage segment with Cena confronting Brian since he's been such a big champion of, of Daniel Bryan's on TV. You know, you would think he's the guy's best friend or something. Actually, Zack Ryder once, if you remember that whole storyline, he used to call John Cena his friend. Oh, They were like best buds on TV, Cena and Zack Ryder. Meanwhile, Ryder was going out there every week. He was in a body cast. He got the hell beaten out of him by Kane every week. Some friend John Cena is. But maybe you got Cena, you know, in a segment trying to talk some sense into him and... And the Wyatts don't really appreciate him meddling in their affairs, and they end up costing Cena the title in his match against Orton. That's the direction that I could see them going in. Some other stuff from Raw, just running through it real quick. The uh, CM Punk-Seth Rollins match turned into a good match. Uh, It's funny, somebody uh, tweeted Punk about what a great match it was, and Punk responded by calling it garbage. Punk was not happy with that match, and I could see why, because if you go back and watch the beginning of the match... There were a few spots that looked a little clunky, like they there was like a miscommunication. There was one, there was one move I forgot what it was in particular that really looked like eh, I don't know if that was supposed to happen. It looked kind of nasty, but they recovered well from it, and they they ended up having a good match. But it was a little rough around the edges, so Punk apparently was not happy with that match. But the thing about this is they they were in there for like 15 minutes together. And they had what ended up being a good match. John Cena and Seth Rollins the week before on SmackDown actually had a really good match. And what I like about this is they seem to be putting a lot of emphasis, at least now. Maybe it's just the phase and then two weeks from now it'll be forgotten. But they seem to be putting a lot of emphasis on Seth Rollins for a change. Which is nice to see. You know, everyone always talks about Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns is going to be the next big thing and I think he will be. Dean Ambrose is going to be awesome. Even, you know, if people are worried what's going to happen when the shield breaks up. Ambrose will be just fine. Ambrose is probably the one guy I worry the least about. Because as a heel, he'll be just fine. He doesn't need to be associated with anybody. I'm not worried about him. But that's all anybody ever seems to talk about is either Ambrose or Reigns having a bright future once the split happens. But Rollins has showed that, you know, he's somebody who should not be forgotten in that equation. And he kind of reminded a lot of people, I think, that, hey, I'm a great wrestler, too. Don't forget about me. So I like that. Uh, We had an Intercontinental Championship match on this show between Biggie Langston and Fandango. I mentioned this because they actually, for the first time that I can remember, they did the big uh, ring intros where both guys come down. Then they do the intros for the challenger and the champion. Normally, they only reserve that for a world title match. So they're trying. They're, They're attempting to make the Intercontinental Championship something special again. They've got a long, 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 long way to go to doing that and to uh, convincing people that they can be trusted because it's all well and good they want to make the title special now, but what happens when Big E loses it? You know, is it going to go right back into the toilet? Maybe. But they got 
big plans for Big E, and, and they're trying to make it feel like a big deal. And the match itself also was was pretty good. It, it kind of dragged a little bit, but uh, I, I I did notice that they're, they're at least attempting to make the title feel somewhat special. I want to comment on Bad News Barrett here really quickly before we just move on to the end. I've made it very clear that I am not a fan of this Bad News Barrett gimmick on TV. I was a big fan of Bad News Barrett on the JBL and Cole show on YouTube, which is how this whole thing started months ago. It was just a stupid thing where Barrett would pop in. He would literally pop his head in backstage, you know, whoever was in the skit, and he would say, you know, I've got some bad news for you. And the way he delivered it was was actually very funny, I thought. it was. I was very amused. And then they brought the gimmick to TV, which at one time I thought they should do. Many, many, many months ago when Barrett wasn't even on TV, I said, hey, he should do Bad News Barrett on TV. Well, my mistake, because I didn't give a lot of thought to the idea that if they bring the gimmick to TV, it's going to be scripted by a bunch of writers who are going to attempt to make it funny, and it won't be funny at all. And that's exactly what's happened now. Bad News Barrett goes out there, they gave him a podium. That's mistake number one. They give him a podium like he's the anonymous raw fucking GM here. And just, it isn't funny. Just the, the lines they script for this guy, they're just not funny. They're, they're just dumb. And now they've got this floating podium like he's Jesus or something, you know, raising above everybody else. And I don't even remember what the hell he talked about on Monday night. It was just so dumb and so, something about greed and I don't know. Um, it's amusing on YouTube. It's not amusing on TV because... The, the stuff they script for him is atrocious. And my brother actually asked me during the show, he asked me about Wade Barrett when he saw this. He goes, is he injured? Because he thought maybe this is just a temporary thing. Maybe he's hurt. He can't wrestle. So it's just something to get him on TV. And I said, no, no, he's he's healthy. You know, he can go. And my brother responds back to me by going, well, then they're idiots for booking him like this. Okay. And this is more of a casual fan. You know, he doesn't claim to be a smart fan or anything like that. He's just watching this going, this is so stupid. Is he is he hurt? No? Well, then they're idiots. And I agree. I can't say that I disagree with that assessment. Uh, I, I, was, I was listening to Edge on Chris Jericho's podcast, Talk is Jericho, which is actually really good. You can listen to it over on podcast1.com. And they did a two-part interview, and it's in part two if you want to go listen to it. They bring up the Nexus storyline from the summer of 2010. If you remember, Jericho and Edge were heels at the time and ended up aligning with John Cena's team to take on Wade Barrett and the Nexus guys in a big 10-man tag match at SummerSlam. I mean, this was a big deal. They built to this, this big match after that awesome angle to introduce the Nexus on Raw. It feels like an eternity ago that they did that. Um, so they did the match, and it was so, so stupid. The way they blew that whole thing off. Uh, the Nexus went on for many months after that, and they, they they even gave Wade Barrett a win on pay-per-view over John Cena. They did do that. But it's it's like much like the big win Dolph Ziggler got over Cena last year at TLC. What did it really mean in the long run? What did Miz's big win at WrestleMania over John Cena really mean in the long run? Nothing. If anything, it hurt their careers. And that's, I'm not blaming Cena. I'm just saying to take a guy like John Cena... And when you beat him, when you pin his shoulders to the mat, that that's a big deal. You know, Daniel Bryan beating John Cena cleanly at SummerSlam should be a really, really big deal. But you'd never know it because they've completely, you know, mishandled that guy, in my opinion, since SummerSlam. And now it's like, yeah, the guy beat John Cena at SummerSlam and it doesn't even mean anything. Same thing with Barrett. But to go back to the SummerSlam thing, Jericho and Edge on, on the podcast were talking about this. And I was happy to hear them mention that they think the way that the Nexus got buried at that pay-per-view by Cena was incredibly dumb. And I was happy to hear these two guys who were right in the thick of it admit that. Because myself and a lot of other people, just fans watching it, thought it was dumb at the time. And here are these two guys reminiscing about this, saying, you know, they fought hard for a different finish to that match. They thought that this thing was hot. We got to get these young new guys over. We got something here. They should go over. Or or at the very least, don't do the finish they did. And I know for a fact I talked about this at the time on my show all those years ago. They did that one spot towards the end of the match. It was an elimination match. And it came down to Cena as the only man left on his team against Barrett. And I, I want to say it was Justin Gabriel. It could have been somebody else. I think it was Gabriel. 
and there's a spot where the concrete is exposed on the floor. So they ripped up the mats, the padding, and they gave, I think Barrett gave Cena a DDT on the concrete floor. A DDT on the concrete floor. So how do they follow up this unbelievable move, this, this brutal maneuver? Well, they put Cena in the ring, and Cena proceeds to kick out. And then he goes ahead and he beats go- both guys by himself. Nexus, pfft, dead. Finished. And here, you know, are Jericho and Edge talking about this, saying how unbelievably dumb that was, and that to John Cena's credit, because John Cena, that was John Cena's idea, to do that DDT spot and then kick out. And they said, no, it's a bad idea, don't do it. And they tried to, you know, convince that this was not a great idea. And then, like Edge said, at some point, you just kind of throw your hands up in the air and say, you know what, the hell with it. By that point, I'm already going to be out of the match. You know what, do whatever the hell you want to do. And to John Cena's credit, they said in the interview, he admitted to them afterwards that the finish was a mistake. Looking back on it, it was actually a bad idea. But as Jericho said, look at Wade Barrett now. Look at him now. It's pathetic. So I am not a fan of this Bad News Barrett gimmick, the way they're doing it. You know, people, some people tweeted me, oh, give it a chance, you know, maybe it'll, maybe it'll get better. I gave it a chance. It sucks. It sucks. And it really is, it's criminal how they're underutilizing this. I mean, you could say that about a lot of guys. But Barrett in particular, he, he's got all the tools. He's a good wrestler. He's got a, a presence about him. He carries himself like a star. He's a great talker. He's a big guy. You would think they would like that. He's a big dude. Uh, a tough dude, too, right? Bare knuckles fighter. His nose is all busted up. You just look at him, and you know this guy's been in a few fights in his day. And to think that this is the best thing they could come up with for him. It's a comedy gimmick. It's, it's like Santino-level shit. It's too bad. It really is too bad. This Monday, the first Raw of 2014 is going to be an old-school edition of Raw. They're advertising Ric Flair, which would be his first appearance since the 2K14 panel over SummerSlam weekend that cost Jim Ross his job and, I believe, resulted in a trip to rehab for Flair. It was uh, an ultimatum from WWE. Either you do this and you get your act together, or you'll never do anything with this company ever again. And uh, he did what he was told. So he's being advertised. Diamond Dallas Page was in the commercial, I noticed. I wonder if he'll bring uh, Jake with him, maybe. Jake the Snake. There's still time to do the angle I proposed. You know, get him in the Rumble, promote it in advance, get some good publicity out of it. Rikishi, Roddy Piper, Ted DiBiase, IRS, the New Age Outlaws, Booker T, Mean Gene Okerlund, the usual cast of characters also being advertised for the show. No Waylon Mercy. I'm, I'm holding out hope for a brief run-in backstage with Bray Wyatt or, uh, or IRS. Maybe Bray Wyatt and IRS have some sort of, of run-in backstage. That'd be weird. <laughs> you know, back when he was down at NXT and had uh, Eli Cottonwood as his bodyguard, remember him? That was a, a fun rant on the sound off back in the day. Bray Wyatt would do these promos, though, talking about how his father had died in a fire, right? That was the story he came up with, that his, his dad had died many years ago in a fire. So maybe uh, maybe IRS will have to uh, confront his son about this. Interestingly, this month marks the 30th anniversary of the birth of Hulkamania, Hulk Hogan's first WWF title win over the Iron Sheik. I, I would not waste his big return on an old-school Raw cameo, nor do I think they will. But I'm just saying, it's possible... You know, they should acknowledge that in some way. You know, January 23rd would be the anniversary. That's a, a, uh, a Thursday, I believe. And that week's Raw is on the 20th, but that's the night that Batista returns. And you're not going to bring Hogan back the same night that you bring Batista back, so that doesn't really work, I guess. Uh, but anyway, just wanted to point that out. Also, CM Punk faces Roman Reigns, and Paul Heyman has announced that Brock Lesnar will be back on this old school edition of Raw. In fact, he plans to do something old school on this show. How about wrestle? That'd be pretty old school. It's been 10 years since Lesnar wrestled on Raw. Actually, you know what? Scratch that. I would love to see Brock Lesnar wearing a sombrero, dancing to mariachi music again. (laughs) That would be old school. He did that once on SmackDown during his feud with Eddie Guerrero. It's comical. I do wonder, though... And I posed this question on Twitter on Monday night when I was live blogging. I, I wonder what most of these younger fans, because a lot of young fans, kids, right, who watch WWE, I wonder what a lot of these younger fans must think of these old school Raw shows every few months. 
You know, it's still a relatively new concept. The first one they did was in 2010. So it's a relatively new thing still. We didn't have old school shows 10 or 15 years ago. Probably because they didn't need to rely on, on nostalgia to bring in an audience. The audience came because they wanted to see the current stars at that time. You know, they had enough actual stars that they actually made on their own who were over. Where people weren't begging to see all of the old guys. I love seeing the old guys. You know, I, I love the old school theme shows. I'm, I'm big into that. I'm just saying, if I was 10 years old still or 15 years old watching this, I don't know that I would feel the same way. So maybe if we have any any young people listening to this right now, maybe you guys can chime in and, and let me know what you think about these shows. And that was it. That was pretty much all the important stuff from Raw this past Monday night. Not a complete throwaway show at all. In fact, pretty noteworthy, especially compared to that Christmas crap we had the week before. And here's hoping for better things in 2014. Now, we're heading into WrestleMania season. Normally, this is the most exciting period of the year in the company. I, I wish they would try to be as exciting and, and creative all year long and not just for three or four months out of the year. Maybe that's asking too much. So hopefully we got some good stuff coming up in the next several weeks. You can check out full episodes of the Sala Monster Sounds Off each and every Sunday afternoon typically is when they go up on the Salamonster.com, Stitcher Radio, iTunes. We have a free app in the Google Play Store for those of you with Android devices. So this weekend will be episode 308, the first official sound off of 2014. And you can follow me on Twitter as always, at Salamonster, and also vote for us. We are up for... The award for best sports commentary. We are a finalist in the 2013 Stitcher Awards. If you go to stitcher.promotw.com, you can actually, uh, that will take you to the voting page and you can cast your vote for the sound off. Voting goes through January 13th. So if you do that, I would certainly appreciate your vote. We'll be back soon with another sound off extra. I hope to do more of these. There's no set schedule, but I hope to do more of these videos in, in 2014. And if you have things you'd like for me to cover and talk about, by all means, you could email me, the Solomonster at gmail.com. So until next time, again, Happy New Year, and we will be back very soon. Until then, check out episode 308 of the Sound Off this weekend. Take care, guys. <laughs>